So welcome to the uh, Ageria webinar program. Today we've got an exciting project. We've got, uh, we're going to go through open lineage, which I know is very important to many uh, organizations, um, especially involved around um, open metadata and those of us that have been ar around Ageria for a time. Um, this is one of the monthly webinars that we're doing, and here's the, um, the future webinars that we have in the pipeline. So we've got um, catalog building, uh, Kubernetes operator, time traveling with Ageria, and um, so then more development tasks around building a, uh, a connector. We're starting with a repository connector and then the other types of connectors. So without further ado, I'll introduce Mandy and Lupchu, uh, who are gonna uh, present this webinar for us. Thank you, David. Okay, so we are going to cover we're going to give a very brief introduction to Lineage so you get a feel for, for what, what we're trying, the problem we're trying to solve. Then we're going to go through um, sort of how you, um, how you work with Lineage. So how do you capture it? How do you maintain it? So that's the stewardship piece. And then how do you preserve it and make it um, visible, usable by business users? Um, and then um, we will complete with a, a demo so you can start to see see some of the Ageria technology in action. So um, let's start with a, the question, what is lineage? Now, we all work with data and we make decisions from data. Um, but sometimes it's not always right. So here we have um, a sales income chart and everything looks good, everything's going up. But when the worldwide sales figures are look, looked at, something has gone wrong. There's no, it is the, you know, this is an impossible graph, given everybody is increasing their sales, but we're seeing um, a, a, a drop. So, so there's a suspicion. What is wrong? Um, and so what Lineage is all about is, is trying to solve that problem, is, is, is allowing that investigation to work out what's wrong. And in fact, actually even avoiding this type of problem, because it might be that there are incorrect correct values that's driving that chart, almost certainly. Um, they might be inconsistent because different types of processing has created different types of results. Or there might be missing values, and that's actually what's wrong in this case, in that one of the um, sales regions values are not included in the chart, and that's why it looks like it's going down. So this is a very real problem uh, when we use data. Um, and uh, so we use something called lineage. So it, what lineage is doing is it's capturing the way that data is flowing between different um, data sets, the data stores, and also how it's being processed along the way and what that processing is discovered, discovering. Um, and so we can use it to um, find out where the data came from or where it could have come from. Um, we can find it, we can use it when we're making changes so that we can understand, for example, if we change a database schema, how many processes are going to break if we make that change? So we can make sure that those processes are updated at the same time as the database change. So that's called impact analysis. And the other is to actually detect uh, when something has gone wrong, um, which is going to cause downstream data to, 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 to be incorrect. And in fact, generally, it's quite easy to detect when things break. We get exceptions, we get error messages, all sorts of things. But actually, it's just equally important to make sure that things that should have run did run. So we're, mo we're monitoring what we call, we're monitoring that the processes are running as expected. So that's governance by expectation. And for that, we need to know what, what should run. And we also need to know what did run so that we can compare the two together. So three very important use cases for, um, um, for lineage. So what do we mean by a process? Um, there's so much different, so many different types of technology nowadays. Um, and so we need to be able to, to cover that wide variety of technology. So here we've got um, a Spark job and it's reading a file, looking something up in a hive table, and writing to a Kafka topic. So there's four types of technology involved in that, just in that job, Spark job. Um, or we may have, um, so that's sort of a more of a sort of ETL type uh, process, or it might be that we have a call type process. So you might have an API, 
um, talking to calling a microservice behind the scenes that's updating uh, a data store. And that data store is also being updated by an ETL job and the content of it is being distributed by a long running job um, that's doing replication. So here we see a variety of technologies, different ways that things are called, different directions effectively of the way the data is going and different lengths of processes and in terms of, of how long they run. Now, if we generalize that, um, so from the Nigeria's um, pers um, perspective, it's going to gather metadata about this, um, and it will know about the specifics, between, the difference between a Kafka topic. But if we generalize it, actually, as we start to connect this together, um, we can start to see that um, that the well, firstly, that the the the, the, the so you, you know, sort of, you can start to see how many different types of technology and how that 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 flows, but also that um, we need to be able to correlate and link the content and the perspectives of all these different technologies together. So we're going to look at um, sort of how we we do this capture, how we link it together, um, and. Um, um, and how we form this large graph in order to um, in order to give us the full lineage graph. And this is the chart that I was actually expecting. Oops, I've gone too far again. Um, and and so in all in in Nigeria, what we're doing is we're, we 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 link all those graphs together, and then we um, and 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 actually, when you think about it, what we're getting are metadata elements that. That talk, that talk about sort of assets like data stores, assets like processes, assets like APIs. Um, and that, so what, what effectively you're seeing is almost it's going data store process, data store process. And there, there's a few sort of differences in that, but you can see basically, um, we, we can see the, the, the storing of data and the processing and moving of data through the processes. So this is what we mean by a lineage graph. So how do we, how does this lineage graph get created and how does it form? Um, so I'm gonna next cover the lineage architecture. So this picture is an overview of how we, how we, how Egeria manages lineage. And there's, there's three parts to it. So if you start in the center of the diagram and you see the, the yellow circle with cohort, coming out from there are three metadata servers. And each of them is covering um, a different phase of, of this process. So, the, so, so the one um, on the um, on the left hand side is method is, is is actually the capture process, and we need to be able to capture the structure of the data and where it's stored from all the different types of technology, as well as the processes that are run. And again, they're from all different types of technology. And, the, um, and we have two um, governance servers that are responsible for that capture, the integration daemon and the data engine proxy. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in, in the um, um, going forward. Then we have the second piece, which is shown at the bottom of the diagram, which is the stewardship. So if all technology use the same naming conventions for um, you know, for, for different types of resources, we wouldn't need this bit at the bottom. But basically the way that Spark identifies a table in a database may not be the same as the way that we, the, that particular database itself identifies the, um, the table and the way that um, Airflow identifies it. So, Although they're roughly the same, there are subtle differences in the in the sort of the way that these names are generated. And so the stewardship piece is really about reconciling names, linking things together, because we do a lot with technology to make sure that a call technology is called to a standard interface and doesn't really isn't really aware of the caller. So often we have to do additional things, um, which we call stitching in that stewardship piece. Um, so that's the, the second piece. And then the final piece um, is the ability to um, pull that the lineage that we care about. So 
you imagine everything that's running in an organization, much of it, the lineage information is only valuable for a very short period of time. But there's certain types of processing that is required for legal or regulatory reasons, or that um, you know, is a key promise um, that the organization is making. And so that lineage information can become um, extremely important and needs to be preserved over a longer period of time. And so the preservation and use is really about getting that important metadata into a place where it can be used by the business uh, for long periods of time, even though the operational environment may be um, being redeployed and, and, and updated um, on a fairly regular basis. So those are our three pieces, capture, stewardship, preservation and use. We're gonna take each of those three pieces and go through them um, uh, piece, by, piece by piece. So let's start with the capture. Now, there are two types of lineage that we need to think about when we're capturing, capturing uh, metadata. The first is what we call design lineage. And this shows all the possible paths and data flows through the data sources and the processes. So when we look at a report and we see a value is invalid, what the design lineage will be for that report will show where all the data could have come from. So it doesn't tell you that this particular field came from a particular place, but it says these are all the places that data was gathered from in order to support this particular report. Um, and so we can use that design lineage for the traceability, um, sort of looking, going back through the flows. And then the other one is the impact analysis. So if we change something early on in the processes, then we look forward through the graph to see what is being used, what's using that, whatever's changing downstream. So that's what we, that's how we use design lineage. And then the second type of lineage is operational lineage which is showing um, sort of when the process is run, how much data they process, what they discovered about the content, so sort of quality measurements and things like that. And we use that information at, at plus the, at the um, expected values to be able to do the governance by expectation. So this is our capturing of the active, you know, of, 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 and description of the actual instances of processes that run and so this process ran at this time, it processes 10,000 records um, and it completed at this time. That would be the sort of thing that you would find in operational language. Now each of these has their own challenge. Um, so design lineage, I, I, I talked a little bit about that before is that we are gathering um, information about the data sources and the processes from the, typically from the engines or from the deployment processes that puts these technologies into the production environment. Um, and we need to reconcile names and make sure that the capture of design lineage is in line with what is actually running. The operational lineage um, is, uh, well, every single engine has its own style of operational lineage. Sometimes it's really, it's debug logging that we're interpreting. Um, so there's a lot of different structures to, um, to support. Um, and also it generates a huge amount of information. And so there's a, a lot of, <laughs> there is, you need a focus on pruning and removing what you don't need on a very regular basis. So um, they both generate quite a lot of metadata, and, uh, but the operational lineage is particularly bad um, if you just let it, you know, you can't sort of gather everything, you need to be choosy in terms of what you keep and how long you keep it. Okay, so those are the two, those are the two outputs. Now let's think about how we actually gather that information. And I've given you um, a number of hints on this. There's a static aspect about it, which is really saying, this is what's deployed, this is what you can see. And quite often, um, much of that metadata can be gathered during a DevOps pipeline when the particular types of technology or resources that you're using the technology are deployed. Um, and that means that, you know, if, if, if things can be done through the, through the DevOps pipeline, 
you have a, an accurate rep representation of um, all the different resources um, in your, um, you know, in your metadata catalog for to support your lineage. Now, that's not always possible. Um, sometimes you might sort of have the DevOps pipeline say there's a database, and then you use automatic um, cataloging to go to inspect the database and extract its schema and other characteristics in terms of its deployment. So we can do it in a sort of two phase and use the DevOps to trigger the analysis and, and recovery of, of metadata. And it's also possible that different tools um, offer the ability for their, their users to pull new metadata for, for, for new resources through the tools and then connecting through the ecosystem to, 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 to join the rest of the metadata that's supporting Lineage. So we have different mechanisms for doing that, but that's very static. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's describing the things that are involved. And then we have this dynamic aspect, which is, which is effectively tracing the activity that's happening in the processes. And you can see they roughly map to um, the top one is the design lineage and the bottom one is, uh, is the operational. However, it, the, 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 there's, there's a little bit of overlap, which is why we, we make the distinction between the two types. So if you think about two databases and a process that's responsible for copying data from one database to another, um, you can actually catalog the design lineage part of that um, during the DevOps process that puts those technologies into, into production. And then you can have some sort of tracing mechanism in the process that generates information every time the process runs. So the first time it runs, it might copy a thousand records. The second time it runs, it might copy uh, 30 records. And then the third time it runs, it might copy 10. So you would keep a, you would get a history of how much, how many records are being copied from one to the other each time the process runs. So that's very clear distinction between what was deployed and what's running. But if you think about files and you think about a process whose job is to take files from say a landing area and move them to a destination, then actually there's very little we can deploy apart from the process itself. And the activity monitoring that we do when the process runs is also contributing to design lineage because it's cataloging the files um, as the process runs. Now, there are ways of um, to minimizing the cataloging that's needed at this time. It might be you only care about the, the folder level. Um, but if you really want, you know, to, you really need to know which destination file came from which source file, then you need to be doing this level of cataloging. Um, and that cataloging is the design lineage for those particular files. However, it's done using the active metadata capture. So on the whole, it's sort of static cataloging for design lineage and um, uh, the dynamic cataloging for um, operational lineage. But when resources are being created at runtime effectively, then we also use the uh, dynamic um, activity monitoring to create design lineage as well as operational lineage. Now, I said before that one of the um, challenges with the dynamic um, aspect of, of, of lineage capture is that there are no standards and every processing, well, a lot of processing engines don't do any, and so you end up trying to use its, its logging. Um, but, um, but, but the ones that do all have their own standards. Now, we're very lucky in that, um, the, uh, uh, that there is a new project in the same foundation as Algeria, um, the um, LFAI and Data Foundation, um, called Open Lineage. And it's defining a standard for that dynamic lineage capture. And it's, it's, it's a very nice standard because um, it's very clear what it does um, and it's very easy to integrate with it. So it defines the payload of something called a run event that is something that a particular engine produces every time they start or stop a process incident or they've got news to report effectively. 
And then there's a definition of an endpoint, uh, which is shown at the top there, um, URL root slash API slash V1 slash lineage, um, that um, a backend can implement. Um, and the first part of that um, API is, is configurable. Um, and so you can, so, so engines don't have to care about where they're publishing to, they just publish to that address that they're configured with, with the standard payload. Um, and so um, what you end up with is these run events, they, they sort of have a number of sections to them where the event type tells you what type of event it is. So if you look on, look on, the, um, on the right hand side, um, the run is the, um, the process instance. Uh, the job is the process description, and then you have the inputs and the outputs, um, as well as information about, you know, sort of the engine that's running it, that's the producer, um, and the schema says this is the structure, because it's a very extensible structure um, um, with something called facets. So the bigger picture here is, is a couple of facets that is designed for the run section of the of the event, and there are lots of different um, um, facets that have been defined. You can define your own for an organization, um, but also there's work with different vendors who are, who are working with these lineage events, um, who will be um, who, who will be extend basically extending, um, and, and this, so these num the number of facets that we have will, will be growing. Um, but this is this is really good. So basically, if you think about this very simple process, what you would expect is when the outer process outboard file data file starts, it produces a start event. Then as each step starts, it produces a start event. Um, when it finishes, it produces a complete event. And so you get a, a trace all the way through of what when things started and when they stopped. So you can see that the you know, things are running normally. Um, plus, there's also um, the ability to write like, additional information around uh, what, what's inside, you know, what actually happened when that process ran. Um, and so you can take um, you can take those events, and um, there's another um, LFA and data project called Marquez, which is a reference implementation. So this was the team that actually came up with the initial definition for open lineage. Um, and um, so obviously they they support um, it. And I actually been using Marquez as a, as a sort of final arbiter of whether a jury was supporting these events properly. Um, so it's a very nice project. Its job is to monitor the runs of different types of processes. And so it uses open lineage events in a lot of its analysis. So it's a, it's a very nice little tool. Um, the other thing that's going on in the Open Lineage project is, is a, a new server called the Proxy Backend, um, and its job is to take is, is to support that API for the particular engine, and it's designed to be deployed with the engine, um, and then it's able to output the events to different destinations. And at the moment, it supports a Kafka topic, um, and that makes it nice because um, it's very easy then for something like Ageria to come along and listen on a topic uh, it's very good at that we do lots of that um, and then bring that in and start to create the design lineage um, that uh, we need from uh, from the uh, sort of active open lineage logging so that's that so that's that piece there now the other thing we did was to say well you know there may be situations where we actually want an engine to talk directly to Ageria. So Ageria also has the open lineage endpoint implemented um, in the integration daemon, and it's part of the lineage integrator to OMIS um, in service. So again, it's doing the exact, you know, it's just a different path into Ageria when we, we use that API. Um, and so we have um, a uh, sort of working uh, um, demonstration of this that, um, allows um, events to come in through different mechanisms into Ageria. We can then um, process them, gather the design lineage, lineage from them. Uh, we can um, correlate that information with other types of metadata capture that are coming in through different types of um, metadata exchange. We can push out to the API, so we can have Marquez listening for things from Ageria. Uh, we have something called the Open Lineage Log Store that allows um, lineage events to be written 
uh, into a, a directory so that they can be processed later. We can use our governance um, action processing to do um, uh, governance by expectation to actually analyze either the log store or through API calls to Marquez to make sure the right processes are running at the right time. Um, and uh, I think that's that's most of what's going on. So this um, this is an example of the lineage store. Um, so it, it just basically um, groups um, jobs by by type um, and uh, captures the start and stop each time that that particular job runs. And then you can see the, the JSON structures of the particular events there. Um, and here are the different supplied connectors that we have in Nigeria that um, you know, allow us to receive um, lineage events either you know, from Kafka. We have the ability to monitor governance actions as they're running through Nigeria and produce lineage events because effectively we're a processing engine when we when we run um, open open sorry governance action processes. So we can produce open lineage for things like Marquez. Um, and so we can produce, we can receive, and we can um, catalog from what we receive, and we can push out either to the API or to the file system. So we have very extensive support, both as an exchange, we can augment um, events, um, and we can also capture information from them. Um, and this is just an example, this is Marquez's UI. And you can see this particular job has run three times. Um, so there's three events. And the first time it was run, it was just done on a direct call to, to Marquez. The second time it went through the proxy backend to, um, uh, to Kafka and then through Algeria and back and, and into Marquez. And then the third time it was a, um, issuing a REST call to Algeria and Algeria then pushed it to Marquez. And Marquez is completely unaware um, you know, which, which route the event took um, and it's correctly recording, you know, the three runs that, that happened at the job. Um, so we've got, we, we, we are able to, you know, the route that the, these events run to is, um, uh, doesn't affect their content. Um, so um, I've covered the capture part, um, including the log store. I'm going to spend um, a minute on the... Uh, the, the stewardship piece, and then I'm going to hand over to Lucho to talk about preservation and use. Um, so stitching is you know, something we try and avoid through um, um, our um, to, 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 to naming conventions and other types of things. But ultimately, there are cases where the metadata that we capture is not linked together, so we don't get that lineage graph. Um, and so there are a number of, of relationships that can be manually added to connect things together and, th and those those things we can either sort of say well this this technology interacted with this other technology using the data passing relationships and you can see that we've got a process makes process a equals process b um, we also have the ability to, to link two things together to so say actually these are equivalent so you might have um, a process a, um, a processing engine that takes definitions of processes and, and sort of and orchestrates them. Um, and so the outputs of one process are automatically transferred into the other. And so that's where we use lineage mapping to say these, these columns here are the same as these parameters here. So that's the, the, the basic idea of stitching. Again, the more that can be automated, the better, but um, there are cases where stewards need to manually add those relationships to connect the graph together. Okay, so we're on to the last section. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lucho to take to to to, to take us through that um, and also to run the demo. Thank you very much, Mandy. Let me. Can you please? Uh, because I'm getting that. Oh, I'm sorry. Tables, worse. There we are. Try now. Yes. I hope you can see my screen actually uh, now. Now we can, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. So uh, let's discuss about what happens when uh, we actually settle the capturing part or 
in a way we, we what do we do with the metadata that is uh, lineage worthy and what we uh, what we do to preserve it and uh, how can be later on uh, used. So I'm going to walk you through uh, uh, one uh, similar diagram that Menti presented in, a, in the previous architectural view. Uh, basically, this is a view that describes how we can, uh, how we actually do capture design time lineage. I mean, and they explained well what that is. So we want to capture how things are supposed to work. And in this particular setup here, we are, uh, this is what this picture shows that we can do that in a, in a, in a different ways. So one of them being quite similar to what we already saw. So uh, through a dedicated server called Data Engine Proxy. So this is a dedicated uh, server piece that uh, is going to uh, extract metadata out of uh, external technologies that either uh, either transform or, or uh, process data. So uh, that is the first uh, way how uh, this piece can uh, ingest metadata for lineage. And then we have a similar one uh, that is uh, a third party technology directly calling the, sim uh, the same uh, piece of component here called data engine on mass. So this is an access layer. And the purpose of these two is to, to uh, get the metadata to a cohort. So that's, that's uh, always the case. So that's well-known uh, aspect of Egeria where we want to share the metadata coming through different paths. And in this case, uh, this is uh, just two ways of how, how we can do that. But uh, the important things is, the thing here is that once it gets on the cohort, we are able to, to uh, no matter how it was captured, either through one or the other, or even uh, with integration demos, which is quite similar to data engine, proxy server uh, in an automated fashion. No matter how we do that, we actually will end up in a cohort. And from there on, we can, uh, we can uh, preserve, uh, we can actually first of all, uh, consolidate them, that metadata that is worthy for lineage. We can uh, build up uh, lineage for each and every asset that, uh, that, that we are interested in to, uh, constructing a lineage for. And then uh, once that small piece of information is complete, then we can send it out for archival or for storage on the right-hand side here, uh, something described like an open lineage server that runs uh, different uh, steps to preserve it and store it for later, uh, later on a retrieval and use in a different use cases, mostly from a business perspective on uh, to this, to, 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 to uh, fulfill some of the uh, aspects like uh, tracing of data, like uh, what Mendy showed before, like impact analysis, as well as some operational uh, monitoring aspects. So uh, the important thing here is that uh, we we uh, are any, uh, in, in any way, I will just re repeat that part, in any way we're ending up with uh, uh, events that are picked up on the cohort by a component dedicated for lineage that, that is uh, that runs in a metadata access server. So it has access to the cohort and its responsibility is to transform and consolidate the metadata and send it out on a destination, like an event that is optimized, I will say, for a graph uh, processing. Uh, okay, up to here, we, uh, we, uh, on the next uh, slide, let's look at what happens actually up, uh, after this uh, uh, consolidation happens. So as I said, the metadata arrives on the cohort and then it gets picked up. So this uh, asset lineage of mass is able to recognize uh, what types of, of assets, uh, what relationships to those assets are important for lineage. And then it builds up, uh, we call it so-called asset context for that, for, for, uh, that is, uh, for, for that lineage. And that it is sent out to that destination, as I said before. What happens afterwards is that uh, uh, there is a dedicated governance server on the receiving side that <clears throat> in turn uh, listens on, uh, on a variety of uh, those lineage events. So the, the small, uh, pieces or elements for lineage. And then through a technology connector, 
for uh, graph optimized uh, store stores. Uh, it it persists that. So in our uh, so so far in our efforts, we implemented one uh, technology connector, uh, primarily using uh, technology uh, graph technology, a, a well known graph technology for us now already, uh, Janus Graph, and then uh, built up a graph store based on those events. So that's that's uh, the the actual uh, uh, part of how how things get preserved. Then we have also some supporting components in this uh, this server, this uh, governance server. Uh, some of them being uh, used uh, useful when, uh, for example, uh, we do uh, from a technical perspective, we do discover this destination. So when this server gets stop uh, gets start gets started, we are able to uh, figure out the uh, destination on where it will receive uh, the lineage events. So that is done by a REST API call to a dedicated, uh, impaired uh, asset lineage mass server. Uh, then further on, we use the same API route to, if needed and when needed, to retrieve extra metadata to build a lineage graph or enrich the lineage graph. Uh, such an example will be, uh, we received uh, uh, metadata or lineage information that some column, some schema element is connected to some other schema element but in turn, we need to understand also wh wh where those uh, schema elements are coming from. So there is a uh, process that will fetch the, the, the extra details and uh, recognize the asset. And then this, this graph will, will get enriched. So, uh, and that will be done once because uh, if uh, it is a column to a table, then we only need to, do, to fetch the table once for all columns. So it's kind of a lazy load of the graph to uh, to be to do it in an optimal way, so that's one feature of this. Then uh, in the background we have uh, dedicated tasks or jobs that run uh, behind the scenes, and those uh, either optimize some routes, some lineage routes, or uh, augment the the graph so we can uh, more optimally query it later on or in turn, they, they carry for uh, just to retrieve uh, a change assets. So if something changes and for, for uh, that particular metadata, we don't have a, a event-driven mechanism to update the graph, then with this job, we can fetch uh, and see that there are more differences uh, somewhere in the cohort, then update the state here. So for special cases, of course, but regularly when everything runs fine, uh, everything should get up to date. We can also perform uh, initial load with that same uh, approach. So when nothing was shared before in, in the point in time, this, this job can actually pull and um, figure out that uh, something can, uh, is already there and can be generated lineage out of it. Uh, we can generate lineage out of it. And then at the end, it's uh, it, it's it's API or it's public API that can export the metadata for lineage out on uh, REST endpoint. So uh, any tool, any in this uh, picture here, lineage uh, graphical user interface can uh, make a use of it to build a nice uh, business views on top of what is. Uh, what is being generated in this lineage graph. So there, we will, as we will see on the next uh, slides, there are quite some interesting business work in use on the metadata. But first, before I, we look into maybe the conceptual side of it, I would like to give a demo now. Uh, and this demo will showcase uh, what I actually explained as a, as a architecture, we'll briefly and in a simple way, uh, show how components interact. And for that purpose, I will uh, use um, a notebook. So Hanzo Labs is well-known place where we store uh, our tutorial or one way to store our tutorials or how, how things work. This, this got recently uh, released. So uh, I'm, I'm going to use this for this uh, demo and show exactly the same uh, uh, setup 
or actually I will go back. I will be showing uh, the, the color here to the data engine. So not the automated uh, proxy part, but uh, for the purpose of the demo and the sim simplifying things, I will be uh, executing calls to the data engine on mass and this part should generate lineage picture. And we will see it in the user interface. Okay, let me try to switch now to my environment. So as I mentioned, this is uh, the hands of labs. We have a dedicated uh, uh, lab for lineage. So just to mention before I before this demo, I prepared the environment so we can save some time. What I did, I uh, went through this one-time task, which is to configure uh, the environment, and we can so we can switch on directly on the uh, actual demo, which involves the open lineage uh, steps. So this is the dedicated um, uh, lab exercise. And is, 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 if you might already, you might know, uh, this is always, uh, we, we write this in a way that we always describe some business scenario through uh, describing that fictitious organization, so Coco Pharmaceuticals. And in, in this scenario, we are going to uh, uh, build a lineage or uh, two of the employees are going to try to manually uh, capture lineage by using data and genome mass. And uh, that is for a purpose of improving the, uh, I don't know, the trans data traceability for some old technologies, legacy technologies. So let's see how that goes. In this uh, setup, we have, uh, you can all already recognize more or less some of the boxes from the previous uh, diagram. So we have here more specific deployment of Egeria that uh, the organization has already, where uh, more important pieces uh, are the, the actual. Uh, so this is uh, a platform hosting multiple metadata servers. So one of them uh, is the one that is going to be used. So uh, Coco MDS1, so that's the metadata server where uh, data lake uh, metadata is stored. And then we will uh, use one of the governance servers in the landscape, uh, and uh, that is uh, the Coco OLS1. That is uh, the uh, open lineage server I was talking about in the previous slide. And uh, there will be some supporting things that are already running under the hood. So I use the Kubernetes deployment for this. Everything is running on my uh, local Kubernetes. And uh, things will be, um, I hope everything will run smooth. So first thing is to check the environment. And uh, as I said, I configured it before. So I will just uh, wait for a while now to start. And then I will start with the uh, actual calls to demonstrate how, how things work in the background. <clears throat> so it will take, uh, until, until this gets uh, up and running, it will take for, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Um, let me talk about the uh, what is the, the actual exercise here or what is the, the demo about. It's about design lineage, as we discussed before. So capturing or really simple attempt to capture a design on a process on how uh, in a specific process in an organization is supposed to move the data. So in this uh, picture here, we see that uh, for some purpose, they do want to uh, transform one file and or move it, uh, move one file to another or transform it to another format. So it's uh, some old archive with uh, data like clinical trials in the context of Coco Pharmaceuticals, uh, quite important. And then uh, there is a process running should, that should produce a, a new file. So we have on the left side, data store process and then uh, data store as destination. This is quite simple uh, picture, but it serves the purpose to, to demonstrate how, how things uh, are working in the background. So almost there with the startup. In the meantime, uh, it is good to mention that I'm going to use a user interface that is also deployed in that same uh, uh, deployment for Coco Pharmaceuticals. It's all uh, it's available there, and uh, one of the employees will be checking first 
whether the metadata is there. So I'll be showing that in a minute, just checking. And then uh, we will proceed with, uh, with the part to capture the metadata if it's not there, and then uh, uh, push the lineage metadata as well. So I think the parts that I, I need, the platform that I need, I showed you on the picture here, all the pieces are there now. Oh, actually it's done. Let's see. So first uh, in this uh, exercise, we need to check through the UI if uh, as, as certain uh, assets are already, can be found in the, uh, in the organization. So I will uh, log in as uh, one of the employees. So I mean, so as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, the two files that we are dealing with are old archive dot and, and DAT and then old archive CSV. So let's just quickly search for those. We can search for assets in general. And I will just type because this is a uh, uh, quite generic search. I can type part of the name. And let's see uh, whether I'm going to get something. So it says that, uh, yeah, nothing fetched, not quite user friendly message, but still we can figure out that uh, metadata is not there. Okay, so this is at this point is good enough uh, to, to start the, the, the next step, which is okay, since it is not there, let's try to uh, manually push the metadata through so we can um, so push the metadata that we can in a way either extract from an external tool or our tool that is used or maybe we have it as a information in an automated fashion this ideally can be as mainly explained uh, uh, done in a devops process so provided in a in an automated pipeline but for now we, we will explicitly push it to met to, to Algeria. So you can see here some technical details that uh, I will use and contact the uh, API that is sitting on this uh, Coco MDS server. And uh, let me just prepare the script. And then uh, I will be ex accessing this data engine uh, access point, which uh, will allow me to, to execute uh, uh, all the required steps. So first step is to uh, since I'm, I'm registering an external metadata for a lineage or uh, in general metadata, I need to register that, uh, that and, and, and provide a way how that metadata will be known to the uh, Egeria as a collection. So in that, in that way, uh, I'm registering first the, the metadata capability of, of my external tool. So I can refer to that metadata as a collection later on and use it for or subsequent calls basically to group the, the metadata details. So the first step is to the tool makes or the external platform makes is to register itself. So with this step, we just see that uh, it went successfully and uh, we, we received uh, some unique identifier. This is the unique identifier of, uh, of the metadata capability or the uh, collection that is going to be used to, to further on group or uh, add the details for that for all the other uh, metadata pieces. And uh, I will proceed here with the next step. So next step is basically to uh, manually manually uh, create metadata for the files, so for the data stores, because we ultimately want to to record the lineage between the first data store and then the process and the, the destination data store. So this is attempt to, this call here is to create a, a metadata for a data store of type data file, and then provide the necessary unique name and all the details that are worthy from a metadata perspective. So by doing that, we can see that here, uh, it, uh, again, the data engine endpoint gets called in this time with uh, endpoint and to, to create data files. So this is in process now. 
it's a bit slow because it runs a lot of things in the background. I enabled all the features. So you will see soon uh, completing. I will do the same once this is done. I will do the same for the second file. So the, for the first one was uh, uh, old archive, which is the source file. It finished. So now I will do, I will repeat the step for the second file, which is the destination file. And at this point, already we should be able to, to find uh, either one or the two of them. Okay, so I switched to the UI and uh, you can see my search now returned uh, result, those two files that I cataloged as uh, external uh, files. Back to uh, the steps, next step, natural step is to also do the same for the process. So the, the, uh, the design we looked at had a process that sh should, uh, should do something with the input file and produce the output file. So this is uh, the metadata for that process. Notice here, it's a, a new endpoint to, to create a access of type process, quite similar, but uh, still uh, for different purpose. So I'm doing that call. And I received 200, which means uh, that call succeeded. To check, I can do. Oops. Yeah, it's there. So if the process is there, let me go uh, to the files back. So uh, yeah, we have the files, we have the process. What is missing now from a step-by-step step -step perspective is the, the mappings between those. So. As uh, Mandy showed before, we use a special relationship for this to designate that something is uh, related to something else. And to describe this process, we use lineage mappings. So you can see here, <clears throat> we have this request to create lineage mappings. And uh, logically, yeah, source attribute is the source uh, file. Then we go to the process and the other way around, process to the destination file. Uh, then we are going to produce uh, a lineage mappings. So let me execute that part. Okay. I'll go back to my search results from, from before. <clears throat> I retrieve details for one of the files and what I can do, uh, request for lineage. So you see now uh, the result is one lineage view. Pretty simple, but still describes what I what what was the intention. So showing uh, asset that gets uh, used by a process, then another one created or so basically this is the design describing uh, the 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 data transformation that was intended at the beginning. And yeah, well, here there are multiple things. This is the UI, I'm not going to get into details, but important things, thing, thing is that going back to now the presentation, important thing is that we can have different views on the metadata that is captured. And what I demoed now is uh, showing a data flow or quite generic data flow through lineage mappings. But that's not all because uh, for more real use cases, we do need to capture what is happening on the low level or where the actual data flows through. So if, in, I mean, we also support this, this bottom concept uh, where if uh, we catalog properly, not only the assets, but the schemas that are associated with them, we are then able to do lineage mappings between scheme elements. So what, what goes into process on the lowest level, what goes out of the process, even inside the process, something called sub-process or uh, activity that happens in the process in a similar way, define its input and output and the mappings between that. So I'm not going to, to demonstrate that because we, we don't have time. That is a thing that is available in the same uh, components. 
but uh, it is worth mentioning that we can also do that low level lineage. Important part, uh, the same metadata then can be queried and extracted for, for different views. Uh, we, we store everything we can to the low level. Uh, and uh, yeah, th 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 this is how the graphs are built up for a uh, dedicated business uh, view. Uh, similar to this, I have a uh, similar uh, thing to, to show is when we want to put an extra layer on top of probably uh, something that, that happens in the, in the data movement and we want to do something uh, more from a business perspective, we can also build this extra layer on, on top. So the business understanding and meaning of what is happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the data movement design. And for that purpose, we, we can extract a vertical lineage view that works in a slightly similar way, but just that in, at that time, we also uh, uh, generate metadata and, uh, and, and, and relationships for uh, the business metadata to the technical assets or the data assets. And then we use slightly different uh, types of relationships, but what that can uh, provide is uh, what was mentioned at the beginning as an impact analysis. So we can see if a technical piece in the landscape changed, and then we can see what from a business perspective will be impacted further on maybe even what uh, solutions, what applications and so on. So we have this uh, feature already being used in use. Uh, it looks something like this. And uh, this is not the full view, but just one capture of how it looks. This is the actual uh, uh, data stores in, uh, in organization where you can see how it is organized and just one view to, to get the, the idea of how vertical lineage can be visualized. We don't stop here. There are uh, still nice things to, to, to be built on top. And one of them being, of course, consolidating this with the uh, horizontal lineage I shown. So with this part where you can actually uh, have a rich way to further on improve the UI and drill down and move vertically or horizontally through the graph so the idea is that that graph will be fed with a lot of information worthy for the business. And then uh, with the proper user interface and tools, uh, organization can uh, just ex get to, uh, all the, all the, to the lowest level of detail needed to, to resolve a business case or whatever. So this is pretty much what I had to show. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time. I think we are a bit over time, but if there are questions, please go ahead. Or I'm going just to hand back to you, Mandy. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So, so um, I'll, you know, sort of what we're with, with um, if you want to interrupt with some questions, that would be lovely. Um, but so, Mandy, um, everything. Um, um, yes, sorry. Mandy, there's a there's a um, question on the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you. Let me look. It's um, uh, static and dynamic. Are the plans to consider versioning and change history? In fact, everything that we have has uh, uh, version numbers um, and we have the ability to maintain history. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it is actually already there. So, good question. Um, so, the other thing is that everything we've shown is actually on our lineage page and i'm going to push the url into the chat so if you want to read more about what we're doing uh, this is the page to consider and it's a page on our new website um, the website's still being um, worked on so you might find a few broken links but this this piece is um this this piece is is, is pretty mature now so uh please have a look and uh, let us know um how well it's good, how, how well we're doing. Um, so we just finish with the last, with the next webinar, which I think is the last chart. Uh, the chair, yes. Yes. Sorry, yes. This yes, right, no worries. Yeah, so, so, the, so the next um, webinar is on the 6th of December. 
Um, I think it, you might need to swap the screens. Um, and it's it's and we're going to actually go into a um, more detail about how you do that automated um, lin uh, automated capture of metadata. So lineage obviously is part of that capture process, but we'll go through um, how you use templating to add governance classifications automatically. Uh, how you set up the integration daemon, how you synchronize both inbound into Algeria and outbound to new technologies. So it's going to be a sort of in-depth uh, look at uh, and how we automate cataloging um, for, for lineage, but also for lots of other processes. Um, and then in January, Nigel's going to take us through his work on running Algeria in Kubernetes and its operator. Um, after that, in February, Chris is going to talk about uh, some of the, uh, the historical support we have to be able to look back at, um, at different um, versions of data, data data over time, based on the question that we had before. Um, and then he's also going to talk about how to build a repository connector in March. So that's, uh, that's the next uh, few set of uh, presentations for our webinar series. David, do you want to add anything else? I'd just like to thank everybody for attending um, and the recordings will be will be on the web, uh, website um, in the next few days, as well as the presentation. So thank you for coming and we look forward to, to seeing you all next week, uh, next month. Thank you.